Hey everybody, this is Christian Buckley and another we're doing another collab talk tweet jam follow-up. So the, the the discussion this week was about building an employee experience platform. Of course, following on the heels of Microsoft's announcement about Microsoft Viva. And I have a fellow MVP here we're going to talk about who participated in the tweet jam and get her thoughts. So Heather, hello. Hello, I'm Kristen. So why don't you introduce yourself, who you are, where you are, what you do, all those details. Sure. I'm Heather Severino. I'm a Microsoft MVP for Office Apps and Services with a strong focus for Microsoft Teams, OneNote, and OneDrive. I'm also a Microsoft Certified Trainer and a Microsoft Certified Trainer Regional Lead. Uh, what that means is that I help a lot of organizations and companies learn about all of these technologies like Viva and everything that's coming out with that and, and how they can adopt those and be more productive and efficient with those. And I'm coming to you from a little chilly and sunshiny Central Florida today. I'm near Daytona Beach. Little, little chilly. So what, it's in the low 70s? <laughs> <laughs> it's actually in the 50s. It's going to get oh, wow. down into the, the low 40s tonight. Okay. All right. So we we won't. Uh, I know I saw a bunch of the uh, you know, with the, with the uh, the polar vortex that's hitting the rest of the country, <laughs> and then you saw down in southern Florida like mid 80s and yeah. Know, so, yeah, right. I'm not gonna complain or anything. We're very fortunate. I feel bad for everyone in Texas and other parts of the U.S. Well, uh, so getting into this, it's interesting and having conversations with the product team. And I know it's MVPs, and sometimes we get access in and hear about things in advance, but. You know, some of the feedback, you know, people are saying, well, we don't know enough about it. And it's like, look, the announcements just came out. And so it's natural that in the forthcoming, the weeks and months ahead, we're going to get like an adoption.microsoft.com resource page for Viva and, and more details around each one of those. And I know that there's info that's coming out on each of the individual, the four components uh, inside there. But I think that the, and my, my goal of the tweet jam was to talk about not just the individual aspects of the four pieces that make up Viva, but talk about the broader, the idea of building that employee experience, that truly that platform. Yeah. And and so that's kind of what the focus was a little bit more. And, and so let's just jump in with question one. I asked you, what aspects of Microsoft Viva are you most interested in using within your own organization? Yeah, well, of course, my answer is everything that has to do with learning, right? I mean, anything that we can do to skill up a workforce and make it easier for them to get to those resources to help them in that moment of, I need to know how to do this or this isn't working right for me, that's a big win. And so bringing in learning management systems and bringing in uh, things like LinkedIn Learning right into Microsoft Teams, again, we're kind of building on that central hub of saying, this is like the one place where you can not only get your teamwork done, your personal work done, but you can also learn, right? So you've got all the resources you need right there without having to do that app to app switching and the context switching that goes along with it. Yeah, it, and it's uh, it, and again, you have people that are excited about. I mean, there's a lot of SharePoint people that are kind of records management and knowledge mm -hmm. management background that are very interested in the topics of the project syntax related things. You have uh, people that are very community related or you know, excited about the kind of the Yammer integration pieces with connections yeah. and uh, you know, but the across the board, you know, the the ability to better surface information in each of these areas. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the key to this. Yeah, and for each industry and for each role, that's going to vary, right? So having the capabilities to kind of focus on these things that are going to really help someone that works in financial or, you know, these things are going to help with the higher education space. So, yeah, I think I think having the capability to kind of bring what. Well, question two um, is something that I was very interested in knowing because because a common question that happens, Microsoft makes an announcement about something, and if it's not yet available, and obviously there are pieces of, uh, you know, most of Viva is available, some preview, there's some things that are out there that are, they're currently selling licensing around. Um, people are saying, well, what else could I do to get ready for it? What What's kind of the pathway to, to going? It's not just like it's a set of features that I just go flip a switch and turn on. Right. There's some pre-work that needs to be done. So question two is, what can or should customers do to prepare for using Microsoft Viva? Yeah, so if you think about it, like any Microsoft technology, you know, if you're bringing Microsoft Teams in, there's a lot of things you need to go and get the settings just right and the security just right, right? SharePoint, same thing. So we have to think of Viva that way too, of 
What do we need to do to make sure that we've got all the permissions and policies set up correctly, that we're turning things on and off that are needed? But even bigger than that, I think, is the adoption campaign. So you really need to focus on what is relevant to our workforce and what do we want to focus on adopting first as we roll this out? And how are we going to approach that to make sure that they're getting the training, that they are going to adopt and use it as much as possible? Uh, so there were a couple of resources I shared, which was like an ebook. Uh, I had it in the tweets. I'd have to go back and look at what it was called, but I think it had something to do with workforce. There was an ebook, and then tech community has some great resources on that too. There's a lot of stuff that you know, people are sharing around it. It's uh, you have to remember this is. It's funny that we have to say this out loud, but um, mm -hmm. deploying a new T technology, a new feature, doesn't suddenly magically make people uh, adopt or get more engaged within a platform. Mm -hmm. And so it's the the amount of work that you put into something, it has a, a, a very direct effect on the value that you see back out of it. And that's certainly the case, case here. I mean, my thoughts too are that, um, especially again, we'll look at like topics as an example, mm -hmm. or in learning, it's not like you, uh, um, you have this new capability you still need to uh, go through and do kind of a, like what's an assessment of what's a catalog of all the content that we have, all the training that we have, the training plans and by roles and all those kinds of things that you can start mapping those things out before you have the technology in place. Mm -hmm. And to, it'll make it easier to go and kind of build those things out, know what you want to do and what your plans are for when you deploy the technology. Right. Similarly for the topic cards, uh, like you, you need to go through and organize your data and the various the content types around you know what are the kind of the templates that we're going to build around that we want these topics to be able to go and pick up and and utilize so a lot of that curation can start even before you deploy the technology yeah you definitely don't want to overwhelm them so being able to kind of turn on which courses or which learning paths do you want can can be a different way to make sure that they're seeing what they need to focus on or what's relevant to them that day right uh, question three, in your opinion, what is the target customer profile for Microsoft Viva? Oh, yeah, we had a lot of uh, a lot of discussion around this one. Yeah, we so did. I, I remember seeing some of the tweets on, I don't know so much that maybe a contractor, you know, a consultant or a small business may adopt it so much as maybe the larger enterprise businesses or corporate environments. Uh, but I really see that it, it applies so many different places that we may not think of from construction, right? You might have project managers that are managing a lot of different construction jobs. And so having all of these things in one place to be able to use topics to find information that's relevant for maybe another project that can help them with that one, that's key. Uh, and then other spaces like legal and financial and education and healthcare. So I think it's really role-based and industry-based that it it's going to cover so much, so many people that can benefit from it. And we're going to get more of those uh, those, those vertical-based, those industry-based examples as companies start deploying that. I think that'll, when you start hearing those real-world stories, and this is, I, I think, the, the lesson here, because you saw some people respond and say, well, it's really just like giant enterprises. They're like, no, what? one thing we've learned about knowledge management and collaboration technology is that size of an organization doesn't necessarily identify like the complexity of mm -hmm. knowledge management, information management. You could have small, you could have a 25 to 50 percent organization, 50 person organization that could have very complex information management needs and that could be a great fit for. So it just depends yeah. on what you're doing. Yeah, when you think about the time that might be wasted too, looking for that information, especially a smaller workforce the time that they're getting back to be able to work on those more productive things or higher value things, that's really key. So I, yeah, I think it doesn't really matter for size. Well, I think, and this may come up again later, but you know, another another thought too, is I made a, a, a comment about the, uh, you know, for all the money that, that it, given the pandemic that we're experiencing globally, the amount of money that's being sell, uh, saved on, uh, on our location. So a lot of companies that have said, hey, we're either in part or in whole going to remain remote. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and I know that depends on role and industry, but there's a lot of companies that are thinking we can really cut down on uh, on our, the spend for office space um, for this kind of this new normal, whatever that is. If you're spending less so for a smaller organization, this is part of my value prop pitch here, but for mm -hmm. a smaller organization, if you're spending less on the physical locations, you need to spend more on the digital locations. You need to make it so more more useful, more you know, tied into how people are working. So, it, yeah, it, you can't just 
the, the out of the box, whatever the technology is, you know, out of the box is rarely going to meet the ongoing long term needs. You need to then fit it within the culture of your organization. So yeah. spend less on office space, spend more on your digital spaces. Completely um, agree. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So question four. What are your thoughts on Microsoft Viva as a brand or Viva La Microsoft? I was going to say, uh, should we say together? <laughs> uh, and, and how does it fit with the Office 365 and Microsoft 365 brands? And I was wondering, too, I think somebody brought up offline, says, how does Microsoft Viva translate into other, uh, you know, because there's the word for Viva, uh, you know, in other languages that's not Viva. Of course, it's a brand name, so it would be Microsoft Viva in every language. But... Mm -hmm. Again, there's a when you're using common words and the way that it translates and is used and looked at. But what do you think of it as a brand, and how does it fit? I, I, I like the name. I, I out of the gate almost think that it does need to be, and maybe eventually the name will kind of morph a little bit. But something that does tell us that this is more about employee engagement, um, in some capacity, right? Um, the, there was an offline, well, not an offline, but a little side conversation that a couple of us were having in, in the tweet jam about there are other things that are named Viva. So there is a platform, a biotech platform that's V-E-E-V-A. And then I think there's like insurance, Medicare kind of companies that also have the word Viva. And the paper so towels. On, yeah, what industry you're in, it could be a little confusing, but but I do like the name. I like that it's short. I like that it's simple. Um, but how does, that, how does it mesh in, though? I mean, when you talk about it, like, you don't go in now and, and, and say, well, we're not deploying Office 365. We're not deploying Microsoft 365. We're deploying mm -hmm. Microsoft Viva. Like, no, Microsoft Viva is a subset of Microsoft 365, of the overall platform. Yeah. And Office yeah. 365 still exists. So, yeah. like, so it's more on, like, that side where it could be confusing of, you know, what do we have in place? What are we actually doing? Yeah, I kind of see it like a Delve or Yammer or Office Graph, like some of those things where there might be some apps, there might be some services. What is it really? How does it plug into the whole Microsoft 365 ecosystem? I mean, I get it. We work in technology. We probably both kind of get what it is. But for that end user, I could see where there might be a little bit more uh, of an explanation or a way that you'd need to, to introduce it. Right. So it's, uh, yeah, so I mean, look, Microsoft has done this before, and there, were the, there are some brands that kind of merge. Delve is a great example. Like Delve, while it's still out there, I mean, it's there's not the hype around it. And sorry, product team members that are like, oh yeah, Delve, we're still out there working on stuff. But the majority of the Delve functionality of what it is, it's more of a native experience that's being built into the multiple workloads. And so it's still, it was more of like an initiative than it was a product right. uh, you know, location. And, I, and so I look at Viva that way, whether Viva a year from now or two years from now, we're talking about Viva. W when I hear Viva, it, I look at that as that is a layer of capabilities that it's extending you know, the out of the box Microsoft 365 experience. So mm -hmm. the, the, you know, the, the, the logos and stuff, which are great out there, but you know, and the, the branding, the name of it, of that itself, is less relevant because it's still about Microsoft 365. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, if you approach it that it's all of the things you might already be familiar with or you may have been exposed to at some point, like My Analytics or Insights or different things in Delve that you were able to kind of find people that work on common projects with you, it, it's all those things that you already have. It's just that it's being packaged and brought into that hub, that space that you can work with it in Teams and elsewhere. Right. No, I'm, it's uh, well. We'll get into it a little bit more with some of these, but I mean, it's a again anything that helps surface the the things that we're already doing mm -hmm. and helps us to better understand from a cultural standpoint, like how we're working and how we can improve how we're working together. That's all a good thing. It's it's a you know it's a it's a way to be more reflective about the way that we're working together, not just a matter of uploading documents following a threaded conversation, get back out. But how does this, in the in the long play of us working together, you know, mm -hmm. what can we do to improve and, and, and how can we get other people more involved? Because I think it's the, I just, I just said this in, an, in another meeting that I just got out of, you know, the more, we understand this intuitively, that the more people in your company that are collaborating and the more active, how engaged they are, the better the output, period. We understand that. 
And so if we can uh, you know, help organizations to be more reflective and to better connect and work together and thereby get more people in their collaborating together, working together, mm-hmm. that will do more, will do, you know, it'll be more accurate, there'll be more IP created, kind of all those good things that we get out of collaboration. And still and still feeling healthy about it, right? Like well-being right. is a big part of it yeah. too. So right. You know, five hours of meetings might be a bit much, but if you could see that with some analytics. In a row. They're spread out over the course of a day, but when it's, you know, back to back to back to back to back. (laughs) Um, Let's see, question number five. So how much of a role does uh, employee experience play within your current modern workplace strategy? So for yourself or for your your customers? Right, yeah, so it's big, you know, I don't have a lot of people working for me with my company it's it's pretty much me i might have some contractors depending on the project that i have so i'm working remotely most of the time especially now not traveling anywhere so it really is key for me to be able to be able to communicate with them and collaborate in real time on things and not have to wait for that email to come back especially if we're different parts of the world um you know different time zones it, it really it's really helpful to me it's, and so i think this is going to be a nice shift for me you know already a lot of those good habits in play but i think this is going to help me be aware of where i have those inefficiencies and be able to build more good habits to work with others i know that with with uh, companies that i've worked for in the past i'm sure you've had similar experience where they Mm -hmm. you know they have a very you know prescriptive flow of of work of way that you need to go to work and you have to be like now i've got to log back in so i can update my status in this one location and Mm -hmm. so it's very restrictive and what happens in those restrictive collaborative environments um, is that you know people tend to go and get their work done around this system and they go into (laughs) the minimums they need and go around that and so you when i think of the this topic of you know employee experience and how how it affects my approach to it i do think of that like you need to be flexible like the end of the day you want more people involved well you can't go out there and dictate one way of doing things and then expect you get everybody involved mm-hmm. by offering different modes of collaboration. Um, but you you want, at the end of the day, we're driving towards common goals, but you want to be able to support the different styles than this, the subcultures of collaboration styles within your organization and support those things. So even as an independent, you know, you probably, you, know, you have some clients that want to do everything via email. Others that they want to do real time meetings, others that they want to, um, you know, send record video examples of here's what I went through and walk through and provide documentation. And you know, so the, you have all these different styles. You want to be able to support all of those things, mm-hmm. but you want to then have that global view of here's all my projects. Here's all the work that I'm that I'm doing. Here's here's how they I'm balancing my time in between each of those things where I feel I'm being more effective and and learn from those experiences. So support the different styles, but then, you know, uh, um, figure out a better way of, you know, bring new ways of working to some of those people that are all email all the time. Yeah, Yeah, I've got a great example for you, Christian. A friend of mine who happens to work for a company that I've also done some work for, she's in the healthcare field. Um, You know, I got together with her recently. She told me that she logs into Teams every morning because that's the way that they kind of do the time clock clock in and then she logs out of it um, because she doesn't want to be bothered with it and I said oh there's so many great things so about teams we had a great conversation about it I'm like that awareness if you're not aware of what's possible there and how you can chat with other colleagues and the types of work that you can get done there instead of being in your digging out of your inbox all the time so it's that awareness that training the adoption you know everything that I think Viva is going to bring to that and with the announcement of this shortly after it, it came to mind, I'm like, oh, she needs to, they need to have Viva within their organization and really teach her what she can do with that. So, and right. I wonder how many people are doing things like that. They just, they don't get what's available, what tools are there, and they're not utilizing it. Well, a great uh, example of that too is the, you know, the the personal insights uh, that you get, that you can get. I'm always, it's just funny because I do some things that are all within teams and within office. And of course, Work happens. It's on the phone, or you know, I'm looking at my desk. I'm I have these you know yellow yellow notepads and things that I, I still I'm old school that way. Not using OneNote. Come on. I do. It's also <laughs> open on my screen. I do that, and I have to do open on my screen, and yeah, all those things. But anyway, 
So I get like the analysis and it says like over your week is that you had all this free time. I'm like, no, I didn't, you know? <laughs> and so part of it is I'm trying to change the way that I work. It's like leaving teams open and on mm -hmm. and, and changing my status to unavailable. I still have visibility. I don't get bothered by all the notifications while I'm working on something else, mm -hmm. but I'm still there. So if I'm able to catch something and see something and jump in and participate, um, I, I, I'm aware there are the dangers of uh, multitasking and yeah. being careful. I'm trying to be sensitive to that. Um, but I am trying to be aware of this is how the tools are capturing this information because I want to find out where am I usually or how am I using my time? Mm -hmm. How can I better spend my time? And back to your, your kind of the healthy working habits as well. Uh, I, I do want to start paying attention to those. It's like I, I've got my Apple watch that tells me to breathe every once in a while or says stand up. I'm starting to listen. I'm not wearing my watch, but I'm starting <laughs> to listen to that kind of stuff because I, I understand how important it is to take regular breaks and to uh, to block out time to work on, you know, things my, myself and my own health and personal things and not just focus on work. Yeah. Uh, let's see, uh, do, do, do. question number six, and I'm sure we had a bunch of Microsoft people lurking in specifically for this one. Um, what pieces would you say are still missing from Microsoft's employee experience strategy? I know it's brand new. Yeah. <laughs> uh, for me, one of them was user voice. We need a, a definitely need a user voice page. I'm sure they'll have it at yeah. some point to gather some feedback and more adoption resources. There are some that are out there and, and that's probably gonna come with people using it and you know, some, some maybe some round table focus groups or something to kind of gather what's needed for that. I agreed. I, I think uh, I'm actually surprised that day one with the announcement that there wasn't an adoption page and a bunch of other resources built. And I know they're building that, that stuff up and it'll be there. I'm confident mm -hmm. of that. Microsoft has gotten really good at that. But they've also, with other, you know, less complex products, you know, at day one had resources and, and things that are out there. And now when you get major uh, Teams feature releases and things and the documentation will be there immediately with the announcement. So I, I would have liked to have seen more in that area as well. One other area I think is a, is, is kind of a next Piece. And I know that there's things happening, but as task management, of course, is a big aspect of that and integrated across these different pieces. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested to see what Microsoft, I know it's part of the strategy, but to see how that is folded in uh, with the, we have, of course, the you know planner and the, the tasks app and, and kind of all those things and to do and how all those things weave in together into the Viva perspective will be interesting. Yeah, I'm curious about that too with sticky notes and maybe some more things that they can do with Outlook email and meetings and, and different things that, you know, when you're taking notes, what, what can they do with that to help us not have things slip through the cracks? And and uh, and with like, you know, post meeting, the meeting actions and being able to, you know, those experiences as well. The system understands that, hey, you just came out of this meeting and you're about to jump into another back to back. What can you do to lighten the load? Here's what you need to know. Here's what you need to have with you. Capture all your notes in this place so that they're shareable everywhere. You know, and so for the system to be able to to, to help facilitate that will be incredibly powerful. Yeah. Agreed. And then we'll start getting better Outlook insights. Like you, <laughs> you spent very little time taking notes, Christian. You know. Um, well, final question here it says overall. Uh, do you think Microsoft Viva will help drive better Microsoft 365 adoption or will it cause more complexity and confusion? I think that all depends on, on how it's rolled out within the organization. You know, are they going to take some time to make sure they get it set up properly that they really understand the scenarios of, of where do they have these inefficiencies and, and where can they build things out to create those work habits to get back that time to make sure that you're able to share resources or information um, with different groups. So taking the time up front and making sure that IT and, and others are, are really digging in to get that set up properly and, and offer some training, like we said, not just set it up, roll it out and, and see if they can figure it out. 
Yeah, and I think that the I think we should separate too the fact that there's a new brand and new offering. There's short term confusion and complexity about what that means and where it fits. And I know we had another question around that, but I think you're right. I mean, the the real issue here is you know we're past that. We understand what it is, what it, what it offers. Mm-hmm. Um, coming from a PM background, I always say that you know planning first versus yeah. you can't you can't just go release something. And then assume it'll be successful. Right. You got to do the planning, do the work, and uh, and really start exploring and understanding. And and that even when you've done the planning and do that initial rollout, pilot some things out, try some things. Is uh, be prepared, have a a good change management model in place to get that feedback and make adjustments to that as you learn about really how your organization collaborates. I agree. All right. Well, Heather, you know, thanks so much for doing this. People want to find out, connect with you, find out more about you. How can they find you? Absolutely. Uh, you can connect with me on LinkedIn. You can also connect with me on Twitter. On Twitter, it's Heather Severino. And if you have a LinkedIn learning subscription, you can find all my courses there. Excellent. Well, thanks so much. Have a great rest of your day and a great weekend. And thanks, everybody, for watching. Bye, Christian. Bye, everyone.